the intent with this talk is to try to give a bit of an overview of uh, the wet areas mapping process as it exists based off of the LIDAR data here in the province of Alberta. So um, I'll be giving a bit of a kind of a primer on the LIDAR technology itself as well as the wet areas mapping methodology and some of the improvements and enhancements that we've been making over the past couple of years to, uh, to try to improve the model to come up with some, some better results as we expand this pro project um, from the southern foothills up into the boreal and across. Um, can everyone hear me fine in the back there? Will this be fine, we think? Okay, great. Uh, so first a bit of a primer on LIDAR itself. So LIDAR stands for Light Detection and Ranging and essentially we have a, a high precision GPS uh, an inertial measurement unit inside the aircraft uh, which controls uh, or monitors the pitch roll and yaw and the spatial location of the aircraft uh, many many thousands of times per second. Um, so with that information there's also a laser sensor in the belly of the aircraft sends laser pulses down to the ground and um, these sensors are, you know, they intersect off of different objects and return back to the sensor. So all these uh, laser pulses that get sent down, you know, 60 to 100,000 times per second, um, with all this information, we get a very accurate, what's called LIDAR point cloud data set, uh, which is what you see down here. So uh, there's different pulses. You can see some of them intercept the tops of this, this farm silo. Uh, some would be at the top strata of the, the trees. Uh, some would be some of the, the sub canopy. Uh, so this is essentially the, the LIDAR point cloud data uh, that is what we use to inform the wet areas mapping data sets. So essentially, uh, you know, we know the flying height of the aircraft because of this GPS information. Uh, we know the amount of time that it takes for the laser pulses to uh, be sent from the aircraft, bounce off of an object and return back to the sensor. So essentially, in its most simplistic form, it's just distance equals speed times time. You know, we know the speed of light, we know where the aircraft is, we know how long it took for that pulse to return. So that's how, in a nutshell, how, how LiDAR data is, uh, uh, you know, basically derived. Um, now, what's interesting for us is the post-processing that can happen with these LiDAR data sets. Um, to arrive at what's called a bare earth LiDAR DEM. So a virtual deforestation, if you want to call it that, um, where the, the canopy and all buildings can be removed off of this LiDAR data set uh, to come up with a bare ground representation um, basically beneath the trees. Again, at one meter resolution, so very, very accurate and precise uh, raster elevation data sets. So you know, we can interpolate across these areas where we wouldn't have any of these last returns to come up with this bare ground surface. Um, so this is just, we'll kind of walk through a bit of an overview s example. So this is just an ortho photo. Um, up in this top left corner, this is uh, the Emen gazebo. So hopefully everybody has a, a bit of a reference as to where we're dealing with here. Um, so obviously we're dealing with an ortho photo, roads in red, and in blue we see the provincially mapped uh, hydro layer. So this is the, uh, the SLNet data set that currently exists. So we can see on this image that there's, you know, there's some, some leaf strips, some buffer strips that were left. Um, through harvesting of these different areas, but we don't really have a good idea of the elevation and topography that's going on within this zone. So what we're seeing here, this is the, the LiDAR derived bare earth DEM at one meter resolution for this area. So, you know, we can see now that there's a lot of very interesting topography, some fairly incised channels that exist on the LiDAR DEM that aren't readily apparent in the provincially mapped hydro layer. So, you know, that was essentially the impetus for trying to drive a, a better water layer uh, a more informed soil moisture uh, model across the landscape. So what you see here is the predictive wet areas map for this area. So you know we're obviously predicting a lot more soil moisture, a lot more wet areas and stream channels across this landscape than was previously available. So in terms of you know deciding on study sites or you know if you if you have requirements for knowing where water is across the landscape, this in our minds would be a lot more precise, high fidelity data set in, in terms of finding these areas. Now another thing of note might be uh, you know we can have a, have a look here and we can see that a lot of these areas are, are connected flows, but there are some like this guy over here that are disconnected wetlands, right? So and there's also some small um, small disconnected areas in through here. So you know, you know, we can start to look at the impact, you know, from biodiversity perspective or whatever else it may be uh, from connected versus disconnected uh, hydrological features. So again, when we overlay uh, the predictive wet areas map on top of the ortho image, we can see, again, these buffer strips were definitely, you know, put in the right spot. Um, but it's most likely that these buffer strips, you know, obviously they weren't known about ahead of time, so it wasn't until a, a forest planner went it onto the ground and actually stumbled across them that they had to GPS them and, you know, define them that way. So 
it can lead to a lot better information ahead of time, uh, can greatly improve your planning processes. Uh, so the wet areas mapping data sets, this uh, is an area uh, just off to the side, I believe, of the gazebo. So again, in, in the Emen land base here. Uh, and as we tend to show the maps, we show them in shades of blue. So dark blue to, to light blue will be more wet to less wet. Uh, water at or near the surface, um, zero to 10 centimeters, is in the dark blue. So what we're just trying to show here in the, this top image on the inset is, is this is an area where the land tends to be very spongy, uh, very saturated. Um, and you know, you're not always necessarily going to have an open water channel, or an open water feature, but you're going to have water very close to the surface if you start to dig a soil pit. Um, as we move into the, you know, this class here, which would be the, the 25 to 50 centimeter depth class, we can see that water is further beneath the soil, um, but the soil is again going to be very moist. Um, it might not necessarily be readily apparent at the surface, but again, if we start to dig, we're going to find that. Uh, and as we move out into the, the last zone that we're looking at here, this would be the, uh, the 50 centimeters to one meter depth. Um, the, the soil can be very moist or, or fairly moist, but again, not saturated. So that is, uh, in a nutshell, how we tend to symbolize the wet areas mapping data sets. Um, so one thing to note is, as I'd mentioned in the previous slide, you're not always going to necessarily see open water channels, deeply incised channels, um, with these wet areas mapping data sets. It's kind of hard to see, but on this GPS tablet here, um, we're standing right in the middle of a, a zero depth of water zone, so water at or near the surface. We can see from the images that if you were to walk through these areas, you might not necessarily define these as, as a flow, right? Uh, they're not going to be a channelized flow, but they are a wet zone. So that's something to, to take into consideration when you're using these maps in your land base. Uh, so again, just a, a bit of an overview, kind of a side profile view. Again, we can see the, uh, the uh, gazebo would be up here. So um, this is just an orthophoto overlaying on a full feature LiDAR data set. So now we're looking at the actual full feature LiDAR. So it captures all of the trees, um, all of the sub, you know, the, the scrubby stuff that's starting to regenerate in these cut blocks. We can also pick up some of the, the plantation lines up here. So it's, it's a very rich data set, and there's a lot of uh, value from this full feature data set as well. Um, but the value for us tends to be in, in this guy here, which is the bare earth LiDAR DEM. Uh, it kind of looks like an alien landscape because none of us are used to seeing, you know, a completely clear-cut area, you know, of these scales. Um, but this is what we use to inform the overland flow uh, across the landscape at one meter resolution. So using this bare earth LiDAR DEM, we're able to predict the locations of, uh, of water bodies, uh, not necessarily channelized, as I mentioned, but these, these water features uh, across the landscape. And using these as our source, and the elevation information inherent in the bare earth LiDAR DEM, we're able to predict these uh, depth of water zones, right? Uh, so this is what, how we derive these, uh, these depth of water rasters. Um, now we'll just kind of have a look. It might be difficult to see towards the back, um, but something else to remember is that although we only tend to show <laughs> the colors of blue for the depth of water raster, it's important to remember that a depth of water value exists for every single one meter cell across the landscape. So this would be essentially a profile of the depth of water uh, throughout this, uh, this little subsection of EMENT here. And again, if we just overlay it on top of a full feature data set, this is essentially kind of what an augmented reality might look like if you were to, to put the wet areas map on top of uh, an ortho image.